Fifty years ago, Gounod's Faust was singularly the most popular opera in the world. As a matter of fact, the opera made the careers of many great sopranos, tenors, and basses who sang the three pivotal roles in this work. But tastes change, and around at the end of the Second World War, audiences, impresarios, and singers began to feel that Faust was a little old-fashioned. The story outdated, the tunes, the music, a little stilted and staid. Well, at the cusp of the 21st century, we're beginning to look at mid-19th century French opera with new eyes. We're hearing more and more and seeing the operas of Jules Massenet, for instance, and the operas of Giacomo Meyerbeer, which haven't been performed in a terribly long time. In the middle of that milieu, of course, is Gounod's Faust, which is now beginning to be performed more and more. Will it ever retain its former glory as the most popular opera in the repertoire? That's one of the questions that I hope we'll answer as we spend a half hour together here at the Athenaeum Music and Arts Library in downtown La Jolla. I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. Let's spend a few moments with the life and times of Charles-Francois Gounod. He was the son of a painter and a pianist, and when he was very young, like many great composers, he began to show early promise as a musician and a composer. In fact, at the age of 16, he was already studying composition with the important Parisian composer Anton Reicha, and more importantly, uh, with the composer Fromental Alevi, who composed La Juive, an extremely important mid-century French grand opera. When Gounod was 20, he won the coveted Prix du Rome. This was a composition prize that was held in great stead by composers throughout France, sort of like our Pulitzer Prize. Part of the prize not only was uh, monetary, but he was sent to Rome to spend a year to study and to work, and particularly to write music. And it was here that he began exploring the possibility of writing an opera based on the Faust story. When he came back from Rome, he got religion in a sense and entered the seminary. He actually thought that it might be a good thing for him to become a priest and, and become a church musician. And he entered the seminary of Saint-Sulpice in Paris to work with the Sulpician fathers. That didn't last very long, only a few months. And when he came out of the seminary, he came under the influence of Pauline Viardot. She met Gounod in 1848 and commissioned an opera from him. The opera was Sappho. Well, Sappho was something of a success, so he began writing another opera entitled La Nonne Sanglante. This, too, was a success, but not as much of a success as Sappho. He also wrote another piece under commission from the Paris Opera. It was an um, operatic treatment of Ivan the Terrible, the Tsar. At the center of the plot of Ivan the Terrible was an assassination plot, a conspiracy against the Tsar. Well, unfortunately, the opera had to be removed from the season of the Opera because in 1858 there was an actual attempt on the life of Louis Napoleon at the Opera. Well, it doesn't seem that Gounod's career was ever going to get off the ground for opera, but this was the point that he chose to start writing Faust. He was almost completed with it, and, uh, but he was turned down by the Paris Opera, and he was looking for another theater to perform the piece. The Théâtre Lyrique, which was also another important operatic theater in Paris at the time, took up the project, but then just before the premiere, they realized that another theater in the area had their own Faust project. Well, they got cold feet and postponed it. In the meantime, as a kind of consolation prize, they gave Gounod a commission for a comic opera. This was Le Médecin Malgré Lui, based on a play by Molière, and it was premiered in 1858. It was very well received, and the Lyrique changed their mind and went ahead with Faust. It finally had its premiere in March 1859. Now here's an unusual case. 
The critics loved Faust. The audience wasn't quite sure. So it wasn't a resounding success at the Théâtre Lyrique. Finally, he turned to a small, scrappy publishing company by the name of Antoine Choudon. Choudon personally published the piece, took up the marketing of the opera, and all of a sudden, within the next two years, we have performances all through Germany, all through Italy, over in London, suddenly France wanted it, America. Within a decade, Faust was the most popular opera in the repertoire. Gounod was now considered an important musical figure in Paris. Everybody wanted a piece of him. Finally, Faust made it to the Paris Opera, and it was a grand success. In 1867, he had another immediate success with Romeo and Juliet. But after that, there were no more great successes for Gounod, at least in opera. And he was so disappointed that for the last 12 years of his life, he never wrote another opera. But what Gounod left us was a wonderful musical bridge between the grand works of Giacomo Meyerbeer in the early part of the 19th century and Jules Massenet and his great works like Werther and Thais at the end of the 19th century. And so we now look at French Romanticism with new eyes and listen to these wonderful works with new ears. In the opera Faust, we find ourselves in the study of a 16th century alchemist and university professor, one Johannes Faust. He longs for death. He's very, very old. He's had uh, a life that has brought nothing but disappointment. He's sought wisdom and he hasn't found it. He curses God in the midst of trying to commit suicide and calls upon hell to help him. Suddenly, Mephistopheles appears. He's the devil, of course, and he offers to Faust a pact. If Faust promises that after death he will become a slave to the demon in hell, Mephistopheles will turn him into a young man and offer him one more opportunity to taste the pleasures of the flesh. Immediately, Faust is transformed into a handsome young man, and they go in search of the innocent and pure Marguerite, a vision of whom the devil showed him just before his transformation. The balance of the opera is the manipulation of all of the characters by Mephistopheles. Valentin, who is the brother of Marguerite, who finally ends up having a duel with Faust and being killed in the process. Siabel, a young boy from the village who absolutely adores Marguerite, who is brought to despair. Marguerite herself is destroyed in the process and in the end imprisoned and ready to go to the gallows for the murder of her illegitimate child by Faust. She begs forgiveness of God and in an apotheosis, which is one of the grandest of all grand scenes in French opera, she is transported into heaven and Faust and Mephistopheles are defeated by the power of good. You're probably wondering why I haven't spent any time yet on the source of Gounod's opera, Goethe's Faust. Well, that great work was wonderful, but it was far more philosophical than it was a drama, although Goethe himself called it a poetic play. But the, the opera is only loosely based on the Goethe original. Goethe began writing this work in 1808 when he was a relatively young man and only finished it in 1832, a scant few months before his death. But in fact, there was a real Johannes Faust in 16th century Germany. He was a professor, evidently an alchemist, and as legend has it, his experiments were so grotesque and so awful uh, and so far away from the morality and the scientific reality of the day that he was dragged into hell by demons for his blasphemy. Originally, Goethe conceived his work as a morality play. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting because at the beginning of Goethe's piece, the beginning of his poem, 
is a dialogue between God and one of the most interesting characters in all Western literature, the devil called Mephisto in Goethe's Faust. He bets God that he can turn Faust away from him by his various demonic wiles. The devil has fascinated all of us for nearly three millennia. He continues to do horrible, terrible things, grotesque things, what we call diabolic things. But at the same time that we're repelled, we're fascinated by this character. And I think this accounts for the greatness of Goethe's work as well as the greatness of Gounod's work, the fascination that we have in Western history with the devil. Since the devil, Mephistopheles, is such a very important part of this opera, I thought we'd broaden the discussion a little bit with my good friend, Joe Colombo, who is the chairman of the Religious Studies Department at the University of San Diego. Dr. Colombo, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. It's good to be here. Let's, um, let's just talk about the devil in Western thought in a sort of a broad way. Um, I know you've, you've done some study in this particular area. Tell us a little something about the devil. Well, uh, two things stand out about the devil. Uh, first, he's an individual who embodies radical evil. And in that sense, he is relatively unique in all of creation. He's the only creature who's irredeemably unredeemable. Mm -hmm. Second, I think, um, the West has struggled with how to understand this unique creature. On the one hand, he's frequently depicted as the opponent or the adversary of God. He's an independent agent acting for evil in the world, tempting men and women to horrific evil sometimes, and he's the master of the world bringing about all sorts of natural calamities and havoc. On the other hand, he's sometimes seen as the servant of God, a passive instrument mm -hmm. who only has as much power as God permits him, and whose actions are, if you will, overruled mm -hmm. by God's own providence. Mm -hmm. And frequently in the West you oscillate between the two. You have, for example, The Exorcist, uh, the movie of 20 years ago or so, where you really do have an independent opponent. Um, and there's a great fight to the death mm -hmm. over good versus evil. On the other hand, you have in the book of Job um, um, and in the prologue to Goethe's Faust, uh, a devil who is something of, of a, a, a lackey to God. He sort of goads him. God enters into a wager with him. But you know all along that God is pulling the strings because the devil only has the power God allows him to have. Mm -hmm. The devil is still a potent force, at least in literature and in popular culture today, isn't he? Uh, much more so, I think, than the 19th century when uh, Gounod was writing. Uh, by which time uh, the devil was largely becoming uh, an emblem of evil mm -hmm. and no longer a malevolent presence that was part of one's life. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he's being secularized and marginalized, and the buffoon-like aspect of his character comes out. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit then about uh, Mephistopheles himself, the character in the opera. How is he acting within this uh, larger context of, of Western theology? Um, I think by the time you get to, to uh, Gounod's Faust, the devil has already been radically secularized. There's nothing really, as I listen to the opera, very menacing about Mephistopheles. Mm -hmm. um, he's ironic. He's detached. Indeed, Gounod um, described the first Mephistopheles, uh, Balanque, as an intelligent comedian in mm -hmm. the role. And in some sense, that's what Mephistopheles is here. Um, compared to, for example, Don Giovanni, he's not at all um, as evil a creature as he is. Mm -hmm. So that I think already by the mid-19th century, when Gounod's writing, um, you, you, the devil has become something less of what he was. Mm -hmm. Uh, centuries earlier. But still, th this character, Mephistopheles, in the opera, he's pulling the strings, is he not, uh, in the whole plot? He is, and precisely because they drop off the prologue in the opera. You don't get that... Um, you, mean, you mean Goethe's prologue? Goethe's yeah. prologue. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, which you find then in Boito's Mephistopheles. Uh, you don't get the sense at this point uh, that God is in charge. Mm -hmm. And he just sort of pops up. Mm. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, you're Appreciate more than welcome, Nick. You know, the opera Faust has been often condemned by critics as being pathetic and sentimental, um, as being an opera that really doesn't stand up to the test of time. And that's unfortunate. Often the characters were seen at least at one time, as being empty. Faust as being a self-indulgent child. Uh, Marguerite as being a simple, heartsick girl. And Mephistopheles as being nothing more than a sidekick. Well, that's to ignore the libretto. Let's take a look at all three of these main characters in Faust. First of all, Faust himself. When we need him, he's a very old man who's experienced much and who has gained much knowledge, but no wisdom. He despairs, in fact, in the face of all of the knowledge that he's gained. He doesn't feel that it's amounted, really, to anything. When suddenly the devil appears and offers him this temptation to turn in all of that experience and all of that knowledge for youth and pleasure. Well, Faust is a free human being. He's free to choose or not choose to be involved in this pact. Once he sees a vision of Marguerite, and here is the tragedy, he falls, I think, truly in love with Marguerite. But at the same time, the strings are being pulled by Mephistopheles. There's another important temptation in this opera, and that's the temptation that's laid before Marguerite. Now, when we meet her, She's being pursued by a wonderful young man, Sia Bell, who's a member of her village, and we suspect that Marguerite returns his love. It's pure and innocent as Marguerite is herself. But in the next act, what do we have? Gifts from two suitors, a bouquet of flowers from Sia Bell, and a casket of gorgeous jewels from Faust of course, by way of Mephistopheles. Well, if you're the young, innocent Marguerite, which one will you pick? She immediately goes for the jewels, picks them up, runs her fingers through them, looks to how beautiful they are, but it's all an illusion. Everything that Marguerite is dealing with is an illusion. Faust is not who he really is. He's really an old man, but he's being presented to her as a young, handsome youth. The uh, jewels themselves are a magic trick, an illusion. They're not real. And finally, she herself takes up a mirror. This is in her aria, the jewel song. She looks in the mirror, looks at her face. She adorns her neck with a beautiful pearl necklace and puts on these wonderful jeweled uh, earrings. And what does she say? Is this truly Marguerite? Answer me quickly. Can it really be her? No. It's the daughter of a king to whom all people bow as she passes. Exactly. It's all an illusion. And that's the tragedy for Marguerite, that everything is illusory. Finally, we have Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles, of course, is the simplest character in the opera. He's like a brick wall. He is immovable. He has one goal and one goal only, and that is to make Faust his servant in hell. All of the other characters bounce against this, this immovable force, this inexorable dynamo bringing us to the end of the opera. It's what makes the role so great and, and what made the role such a perfect fit for those immortal bases, Fyodor Shalyapin and Ezio Pinza. Mephistopheles, this great role, this great character, is the one person in this opera that the other characters can't budge until the very, very end. And when we come to the end, only a miracle will save them. You recognize that tune. It's the waltz from Faust. Uh, in the middle of Act Two, while the villagers are dancing at the fair. You probably 
wondered where that piece came from, but weren't quite sure. Well, Gounod's Faust is rather like Shakespeare's Hamlet. When you go to see a performance of either of those pieces, you're so familiar with many of the quotes that you wonder why you don't know the piece better than you actually do. Well, there are many familiar tunes in Faust. Let me play just a couple more of them for you. Here is the Soldier's Chorus in Act Three. Well, those are some orchestral excerpts, accompanimental excerpts that you might find familiar, but it's the arias that we really remember. The big tune in this piece, which also makes an appearance, by the way, in the overture, is Marguerite's brother, Valentin, his aria in Act Two, as he commends his sister to God, as well as to his friends, Siebel and Wagner, to take care of her as he goes off to war. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous melody. Gounod's Faust has plenty of opportunity for spectacle, but nowhere more than in the very last scene. Marguerite, of course, is in prison for the murder of her illegitimate child by Faust. Faust and Mephistopheles have mysteriously entered the prison cell to try to get her to escape. She's gone half mad with grief and despair. And in the midst of all this, of course, there's a trio with a beautiful, beautiful melody. Of course, that melody has to accompany the spectacle that's about to occur. Here's the tune. Notice that deceptive cadence at the end of the tune. Well, that's because the tune is so long and has such breadth that Gounod really can't develop it. All he can really do is repeat it. But to simply repeat it in the same way doesn't make any sense. So what does he do? He ups the ante of the excitement and the drama of the scene by upping the pitch level of the tune. Yet another deceptive cadence at the end of that fragment of the tune. Why? Well, we have to have an opportunity for Faust and Mephistopheles to say yet again, Marguerite, come with us, escape. It gives Gounod the opportunity for one more modulation to raise the pitch level not only of the tune, but of the excitement in the drama.
The history of Faust recordings hasn't been quite as happy as the history of some other operas like The Magic Flute and Aida. There are only a few recordings of Faust, and certainly only these three are outstanding. But they're readily available for you to go out and purchase to get to know the opera before you come see it at San Diego Opera. First of all, the classic recording is certainly the one conducted by André Cliton with Nikolai Gedda, Victoria de los Angeles, and the brilliant Boris Kristof in the role of Mephistopheles. Now, Kristof's French may not be quite perfect, but the performance is really quite wonderful. This is dated sound because it was recorded sometime in the late 50s or early 60s, but it's a very, very fine recording. A recording of interest to all of us, particularly at San Diego Opera, is the recording conducted by Richard Bonning because he will be with us to conduct our Faust. The tenor Franco Corelli, the soprano Joan Sutherland, and Nikolai Gyarov as Mephistopheles. Now this is a powerful performance, particularly of the role of Mephistopheles. Gyarov is absolutely incomparable in the role. He's a truly malevolent Mephistopheles. And of course it goes without saying, the Faust of Corelli and the Marguerite of Dame Joan Sutherland are absolutely wonderful. A more recent recording is of real interest to us, certainly the Faust conducted by Michel Plasson, starring Richard Leach as Faust. Mr. Leach has certainly been with us many, many times here in San Diego. The Marguerite is sung by Cheryl Studer, and the Mephistopheles sung by Jose Van Damme. Of real interest in this recording is the role of Valentin, which is a relatively small role, but with an important aria, sung here by Thomas Hampson. So you have three wonderful recordings available to you. Go out and get one. I know you'll enjoy it. Now, don't let anyone tell you that Gounod's Faust is old-fashioned or outdated. It's a wonderful opera filled with terrific music. And there's a reason that it was the most popular opera in the world for a hundred years, and it's fast regaining its title. I know you're going to enjoy this great work when we present it at San Diego Opera. I'm Nick Ravellis, and I'll see you at the opera. <laughs>